everyone, and welcome to Behind the Scenes, a podcast where we talk about the intersection of art, culture, and big ideas. I'm your host, Sean Malone, creative director for the Foundation for Economic Education and uh, creator of the Out of Frame video essay series on YouTube. Here today, uh, back with us after his stint uh, with the COOF. Not dead yet. Paul Nelson. Yeah, not dead yet. Not, not dead yet. Paul Nelson, senior marketing manager for Foundation for Economic Education. And then, of course, Jennifer Mafasanti, uh, Director of Communication for the Libertas Institute. Jen, how are you doing? Paul, how are you feeling? I, I'll let I'm, Paul go first. Yeah, no, this month of January has been rough in the Nelson household. Sicknesses have been rolling through. Um, my sons now have... Okay, so basically the last three weeks has just been... Somebody's been sick in the house. Uh, COVID rolled through the house, and which is... Well, for me, it wasn't... It was not terrible, except the problem is my wife is 30 weeks pregnant. Wait, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, so it was right. kind of touch and go with her because uh, pregnancy is considered a a high risk for COVID. And um, But the, the boys, the COVID didn't really stop them, but their school, it stopped their school. So, uh, you know, my I had to I had to help out around the house um, with my wife being sick. So um more than would be typical um but my gosh moms big shout out to moms like well, thank you paul i appreciate uh, I mean, just, that those those little people are <laughs> difficult um yeah but uh no i mean every you know, the boys now have strep throat which is this fun so this past, that's so so bizarre, but we're getting man. there we're getting there you know one step at a time because did they did they like did they go back to school and then come back with strep throat like the next yes. day is that oh goodness yes um I, <laughs> oh my god kids are kids gross are it's, so it's disgusting so gross. um and so yeah uh, we're all alive we're all getting we're i mean we're all healthy now ish ish i mean the boys are still fighting off but they got they got antibiotics but um i just you know we before the show we were talking about historical times and stuff like that about people wanting to live in previous history but like i can I, the, the amount of times where i would have died my somebody in my family would have died from just a very curable illness now i mean we're going through a pretty weird time with 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 communicable diseases but um just in general, our our healthcare at this time period of, of human history is phenomenal. I mean, it's it just blows my mind. It's just so cool in how such a short period amount of time in the grand scheme of human history, how far the medical technology has come to save lives. Um, and at least, in, um, I know we get a bad rap with our healthcare system, but I mean, pretty much everyone has access and yeah. yeah, it's I there's there's a lot of like misconceptions of it. I feel like that's like probably something we should do a whole yeah. show on at some point if we if we find a good reason to because I feel like everybody like I the vast majority of people I know myself very much included like have, I have never had a problem getting an appointment, getting an appointment very quickly, going to see specialists, like all that kind of stuff like just you pretty much just kind of sail through and it's very very easy. Um, the only real difference is that you're not, you know, you're, you're not, you're getting billed at some point as opposed to just having constant nonstop stream of very high taxes taken, yeah. you, which is, which is, you know, you know, it's sort of a different way of thinking about it. You know, yeah. So, I mean, there's ways I think we could get better, but yeah, that's a whole nother. Oh yeah. Many, many. Well, and I, I mean, obviously like, I mean, we kind of talked about this. I, I had terrible experiences with the specifics of healthcare you know, like at the beginning of last year, just about a year ago, I mean, well, literally a year ago, we were dealing with some of the worst kind of stuff. But every single issue that I've got is is government created in a in a very direct way. And it's and it's nightmarish in, in that sense. But I mean, I think in particular, like if you've got just regular doctors and stuff like that, you don't have to go to a hospital or those kinds of things. It's, it's pretty good. But um, anyway, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about um, a spinoff series today, which is kind of, uh, I don't know, it's like one of these things that probably shouldn't work to some extent, because it's also spinning off a of Suicide Squad and whatever. But um, 
But uh, it is a uh, John Cena produced series, uh, written and 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 produced and created by James Gunn, Peacemaker, on the Max, Max. HBO Max. Once again, coming through. Um, Peacemaker, for those who did not see Suicide Squad, is sort of the I'll call him one of the primary antagonists in the Suicide Squad in the Suicide Squad movie that James Gunn just did uh, recently last year, and um, but he's not a he's not a villain exactly. He like he's not he's not the big bad and he's not evil necessarily. Uh, he's, uh, he's probably, I think it'd be fair to say extremely misguided as a human being. Um, the show kind of dives into some reasons why he might be pretty misguided as a human being. So that's actually kind of interesting, but, um, in general, he was a pretty memorable part of the Suicide Squad movie and I enjoyed the Suicide Squad movie. So I also generally speaking, enjoy James Gunn and think James Gunn is a fantastic, uh, creator and director and producer. And so I was, I was pleased and sort of excited to watch this show. Although also I didn't really know what to make of it going in because I think like, you know, it's a spinoff, like it's a John Cena lead, which, you know, he's, he's definitely gotten better. And I would argue that he's probably the best actor out of his, out of, out of like the crop of, of, of wrestlers turned actors he's probably the best one <laughs> um i don't know maybe we could debate that but um but uh you know he's leading the show but yeah let's let's get into it though um jen paul like i i assume did you guys were you guys watching this before we started talking about watching this or did you did you just get into it in the last week no i just got into it uh for this show i mean, i'd been meaning to watch it but i'd been putting it off because i've I am crazy busy and exhausted. I probably worked 80 hours last week and I took Saturday completely off. So, um, yeah, I had like I just hadn't made time for it. So I binged all five available episodes yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same same for me. Um, just now I wanted to watch it because I really enjoyed the Suicide Squad. But um yeah, I just hadn't made time for it until yesterday. But uh, oh gosh, this what I I'd never been a huge fan of John Cena's acting. Uh, I don't think he's very good, but I think this role and what James Gunn has done as far as the other actors and how directing them is it's like it's like John Cena is trying to play it as straight as he can, which is just his acting mode, while everyone else is just like what like is kind of like what I feel like the audience is like, this is absolutely ridiculous, but John Cena is playing it very straight and it just, but that it works for him because he's not a good actor and he is, he looks absolutely ridiculous. I mean, he's, he's just, I mean, <laughs> like his proportions are weird, like nothing about this. You, you, you could just take serious. <laughs> and I think this is why this works so well, because if it, this was anybody else in the peacemaker role, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't feel it wouldn't all really work as well as it does because yeah, just because it's, it's John Cena. Uh, yeah. I think he was, look, I actually think everybody in the suicide squad movie, look, by the way, I'll, I'll just step back a little bit wider here and say, I think the DCEU in general has done an incredible job with casting really consistently. Um, even the, the casting choices that I was not sold on, like probably everybody else in the world, like Ben Affleck, I turned out to really like Ben Affleck as that version of Batman. And I, I feel like everybody got really mad when they announced Robert Pattinson being Batman, but I kind of bet that we're going to come in and we're going to watch John, you know, we're going to watch the, the Batman and we're going to find that Pattinson does a pretty good job. I, I, they've done a really generally excellent job at casting. There are a couple misses. For me, Flash. in general, obviously, Le Le uh, Flash. Yeah, Ezra Miller's Flash is is on that list. Leto's Joker is on the list. Although, you know, Leto's, I don't know, who knows? And like, like just casting that guy in anything is is sort of a crapshoot because he could be brilliant in it, or he could be just a lunatic, and you just don't quite know with that guy. But um, but Cena 
was really well cast in this role. And I think you're right, Paul. He plays it really straight, which you need to in this case, because his character is so ridiculous. Like his character is, is absolutely like one of the dumbest characters you could think of in comic book history, right? Like he is, he is, uh, you know, a pacifist, right? Who, as, as he says repeatedly throughout the series, he said it in the Suicide Squad, doesn't care how many men, women, and children he has to kill to get peace, right? Like that's, he's an insane person. And, uh, and he was an insane person in, in the Suicide Squad. There's a reason why he was in the Suicide Squad and not, you know, a superhero. But then that actually lends itself to a lot of really funny bits in the series where, like, like his interactions with his dad's neighbor, where he comes home and the guy's like, well, you seem like a villain. He's like, no, I'm a superhero. No, he's like, well, I don't know. You, like, you really, you, see, you seem like, that doesn't seem like a, a superhero to me. It seems like you're a bad guy. It's like, no, no. He's adamant that he is a superhero, right? Uh, and he believes it. You know, he, he absolutely believes in himself. Also, I got to hand it to James Gunn and to DC and everybody else for like, like really, like, like you said, Paul, he looks ridiculous. His costume is silly. They're going for it, man. Like this is exactly the, co this is a very comics accurate costume. It's a pretty comics accurate backstory. We'll, we'll get into his, his sort of his backstory maybe a little bit later, but like he's a lunatic and yet he believes himself so strongly to be the good guy. And he's trying to be the good guy. Like he's, he's really trying. He's doing <laughs> he's his just, best. He's just not very good at it. Um, but he is, he is, to be fair, he is very good at killing. So, <laughs> so there's that, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, and also, you know, you've, you've got various other characters that are just some of the weirdest in, in the comics, judo master, you know, the vigilante, like there are a lot of these, these characters that are just so dumb, but in the context of a show that has this kind of tone, it, it's, it seems to work in general which I've, I've been enjoying a lot. Jen, what were your kind of first, first reactions? Oh man, this show is so wonderfully weird. Like James Gunn just really knows how to bring the weirdness and the, the level of maintained absurdity throughout this show makes the heartfelt moments and there are heartfelt moments like all the more poignant and like I'm feeling feelings about Peacemaker like I like I've got a little bit of sympathy now and I 100% did not expect to be feeling that like at first I was really annoyed that this show existed because like oh great it's it's yet another show slash movie about terrible people doing terrible things. And it is, but mm -hmm. I also feel like we're at the beginning of a redemption arc, maybe. It's, I don't know. I feel things and it's weird. He, he's he's trying. trying. That's, that's the, that's the thing that I think is interesting about it. Um, boy, I don't, I don't want to spoil this too much because we're, well, I guess it doesn't matter because Jen and I are kind of writing a, an arcane, uh, an, an episode for Out of Frame on on Arcane, but we we talked about this in the episode we in the in the podcast episode on Arcane. But like it is, it, it's lame to me like to just have characters that are sort of irredeemably bad and and it's not necessarily that the characters in Arcane are all irredeemable. Most of them are are probably very redeemable in a lot of ways, but like they're they don't want to be like they're You don't see You don't get any sense for most of the characters in arcane that they're really trying to be better, like more moral human beings like peacemakers trying. And again, he's not very good at it, but like he really wants to do better. And there's a, there's a good scene and, and we can, I, I don't really feel like this is much of a spoiler. We'll get into the plot in a second, but like, well, actually I'll, I'll just do the plot now. Cause it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Essentially, like it's it's a very it's a it's a literally an offshoot of the Suicide Squad. It is some of the um, a couple of of Amanda Waller's crew, her her um, tech crew, who were in the office with her in the Suicide Squad, 
who uh, ultimately mutinied if you saw if you saw the Suicide Squad movie, they they've been kind of demoted to work on this team just with Peacemaker. And they're still doing black ops. They're still they're still doing all the stuff that the Suicide Squad would do. But now we're on like the B team or maybe like the C team. You know, they they've been demoted a couple levels down. And so now here they are with Peacemaker. And the funny thing about it is like they all really feel the demotion in the first couple episodes. They're like, oh man, we gotta work with this, you know, this idiot, right? Um, but I think by the fifth episode, what's been kind of great is they're they're starting to come together as a team. They're starting to feel something for each other. They're starting to actually like care about each other a little bit, um, which is cool. But like the the main mission is sort of another uh, weird alien, possibly sort of alien uh, body snatcher kind of thing. And, and they're going to sort of track down people who have been taken over by these these weird aliens. And um, he gets he gets told to kill a bunch of kids. Well, a couple kids. Um and he won't do it. You know, he like, he actually won't do it. And, and he said, which is funny because again, like this whole tagline of, I, I don't care how many men, women, and children I have to kill to get peace. But he then says afterwards, he's, he's sort of talking to his, his boss in this context, you know, you told me to kill kids, but you didn't give me any reason. Like, I don't have any, like, I'm, I'm okay killing kids, which is like not a, not a good person thing to do. Right. But he's like, but I'm not just going to do it because you say so, you know? And I thought that that was a really nice moment for his character because it's like, yeah, he's, he's a lunatic and he does, he, he is willing to do things that nobody else should do or, or will do or whatever. But he's also like, he's actually trying to, he, he's not just trying to be blind to what he's doing. He's actually doing it for a, you know, for a higher purpose. Um, again, he's a nut. So there's all of that. You've got to factor in everything that he is a he is a complete lunatic. But like, um, but he's trying. He's trying to do better, which I've I've been in, I've been really enjoying. He's also kind of an offensive uh, glam rock uh, kid who's who's really stuck as a 13 year old boy in his in his life. So I think we'll get into the uh, into the music of the show in a little bit because I've I've been absolutely loving it. But so um, I, I am a little surprised, yeah. Jen, that you like the show because you've said on many episodes we've talked about comedies that you do not like because you don't like things that uh, make fun of people. Uh, I I don't know where this line is. I don't understand your tastes. So please explain because uh, I just don't. I don't. I don't even know what. Okay. Like, I, like okay. I I want like for me I need help because. I, I watch something and I'm like, oh, I, Jin likes funny things, but then I don't because you say I don't. I so please, please let me know what I the the your metrics. Absolutely okay. So it's not so much about the humor being making fun of somebody else. What I dislike is embarrassment based humor, like the entire movie the entire film of meet the parents hurt me <laughs> like it was physically <laughs> uncomfortable to watch that movie because it's just embarrassment and everything is revolving around humiliation there's no real back and forth it's it it's just it feels very cringy to me um, that said, there were some spots in episode one where I was like, eh, I don't know about this. Like I, I, of, of Peacemaker, I guess I should clarify where it was uncomfortable for me and I didn't really feel good about it, but, you know, push through and get past it. And then, uh, you know, the fun and games <laughs> happen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm interested in that because I don't feel like there's that much of Peacemaker that's been like embarrassment based humor. Like he he is an oh, idiot yeah. and we are laughing at and we are laughing at him, but we're also like you're also feeling bad for him at the same time because like even right off the bat you go like okay, so the way that the show opens essentially is he he gets if if you saw the Suicide Squad, you know, he ends up being shot and then sort of uh, crushed by a building more or less. And so 
he ends up being pulled out of there. And and we see this in, I'm, I'm spoiling the Suicide Squad at this point because whatever, it's been out a bit. You've had your chance. You know, and you've had your chance to know that he's still alive, folks, because he's in another show. So here we are. But, um, you know, they basically they pull him out of the rubble. They, they revive him, whatever. But he wakes up in the hospital and he's going through all of his physical therapy and everything else. And at some point, the doctor says, you know, it looks like you're you're clear. You can get out of here. Uh, it's up to you. And he but he, of course, he's still serving a prison sentence. You know, it was the whole deal, right? And so he sneaks out of the hospital somehow thinking that he's evaded his his prison sentence. And he goes home. And then immediately you, you you find out like the man lives in a trailer park, but like he's he's decked out his house like an American flag, and it's like just this whole this whole thing, and he he can't remember where the key is, so he like breaks into his own trailer and it's just you know but but then that's all funny and we're sort of making fun of him for it but then he kind of sits down in his house and you realize that he doesn't really have a lot you know and he's he's not really there he's not really like i don't know there's just moments of empathy like right away where you just go like this guy actually is kind of sad and it's not like we're laughing at him and we're laughing you know, at some of the stupid kind of stuff that he's doing. But like at the end of the day, like he is actually like really well-meaning. Uh, and then of course he gets, he gets roped into all this other, you know, new black ops stuff and going right back into the suicide squad stuff. But like, I didn't think a lot of it was that cringy or like embarrassing. I thought a lot of it is like just set up or sort of preparation for for feeling that empathy towards him which i think has been handled pretty well and honestly james gunn's always done that like he's done that really really well in basically all of his movies i mean look go back to a movie like super for example if you guys have ever seen super you know rain wilson's character is a sad he's a sad sad character and you want to make fun of him because he's he's just dopey you know, and like he doesn't really get the world and he's whatever. But like at the end of the day, he's like, honestly, it's a very similar character. He's a lunatic. He's a super violent lunatic who's actually really trying to do the right thing and just kind of failing. Um, and I, I don't know. I just I feel like that's easy, sort of easy to sympathize. Yeah. With in a lot of I, I but totally agree with what you said, Sean. And to go back to what Paul asked me and just simply clarify the point if what we are supposed to be laughing at is someone else's actual embarrassment that does not hit for me that so that is not fun for me because he's socially inept and doesn't understand social cues then it's fine to laugh at him <laughs> but is he well, I mean, actually he's definitely embarrassed? Not embarrassed like he's well that's He's so not that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. he should be like, that's the whole, that's what I'm saying. So I guess the, the line for you is if, if the person that we're laughing at is aware that they should be embarrassed. Yeah. All right. I'm going to write yeah, that I down. Think this is a, I think <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, but so I think this is, a, I was not sure. This is a good line though, because, okay. So take a look at like, I mean, you, you mentioned me, the parents, but I would, I would pull up something like, um, like, uh, there's something about Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, Ben Ben Stiller's done a lot of sort of embarrassment based and I hate it. based comedy. I hate it all, <laughs> and I get, I, no, but I get why you'd hate it because, like, like there's something about Mary. Really, a lot of its comedy is driven by Ben Stiller is put in an awkward situation or puts himself in an awkward situation, and then continually makes it worse and doesn't really know how to get out of it. And the whole thing is him being uncomfortable. And it's like, I'm supposed to laugh at him being like brutally uncomfortable because he's done something really, really stupid in a bathroom that he shouldn't have done. Right. Oh my like, gosh. Yeah. This is not as much as I can say. That was the best way to that put, movie. I probably can't even. That was the best way to put Frank's and Frank and beans. I think I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing I can say about that movie that would be even remotely appropriate to this to this uh to this podcast so I'll, i will leave it at that but like if you've seen that movie you'll know that like the vast majority of it has been still are doing stuff that he is embarrassed by and that he is trying desperately to like avoid someone else discovering or like try to cover for or like you know 
all of those kinds of things. And also the movie's kind of creepy, to be honest, as well. It's a real weird movie. He makes a lot of bad choices in that movie and then and then gets uh gets sort of weirdly rewarded for many of his bad choices, which I think he shouldn't. He's, but he's um, a lesser evil. It, absolutely the lesser <laughs> evil, but like still. Yeah, I will yeah, still, this, a lot a lot of weirdos. The in that movie. the the embarrassment thing is interesting because they kind of I think it go, kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about Cena being the perfect actor for this role because he is such a um, actor. He's shameless. Well, he, yeah, um, but he has, <laughs> you know, with wrestling, pro wrestling. This is going to come across as a, as a slight, but it this is why Batista works in Guardians of the Galaxy is that these guys are just cartoon characters that. Yeah, only yeah. know how to do yeah. huge big things and that's what they practice right. and that's what they're good at that's why the rock is good at what he's good at like it's but yeah. it, but i think cena is to the extreme but like his normal is just kind of weird yeah also I, i'm gonna have to because you brought up batista i'm gonna have to take back what i said because i actually think maybe batista is the best actor actor yeah. of of that group and to be fair like there aren't many instances of of you being able to see that but i mean i've blade, seen blade, blade runner, runner 2049 my gosh, that's the best yeah. and so he was so I'll, I'll give him i'll give him that right but for the most part you're right and and i think that like james gunn's ability to know when like to write for and to know that like we're gonna give these guys really broad roles you know and they're gonna be you know, really over the top, but they'll play it and they'll play it straight because like that is actually about the, the level that they're, they're playing comedy in a wrestling ring. You know, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Like it actually makes sense. If you fit the role to the character, it actually totally makes sense. Right. But you, you wouldn't have given like Dave Batista in guardians of the galaxy, this like really subtle, fine, you know, fine role to play. Yeah. Like he needs to play Drax. Like he needs to play like this kind of, moron who doesn't understand um you know who takes everything literally or whatever like you kind of need need him to do that but um i don't know uh hampton asked me in in the chat he asked me how we feel about um cena and like apologizing to china and and whether or not that affects my enjoyment of the show um doesn't really affect my enjoyment of the show like because i i tend to treat everything at, like as it is um, without trying to bring a whole bunch of baggage into it. But I mean, obviously like, you know, that was a black mark for me, for John Cena. I mean, I, I feel like that was kind of a moment where he's being a little bit of a wuss. Yeah. And I, it know, was, it was it's kind of lame. definitely disappointing, but at the same time, I get it. He's not an A-lister, you know, he's, no. he's still got to work to pay his bills. He can't just retire tomorrow. And mm. So I mean, he I probably, mean, probably can probably at this point, but like by like normal people but like, standards, but but yeah, he, I, look, it's clear that Cena has a lot more he wants to yeah. do in in entertainment. Like they're like he's only at the very beginning of what I think his his film career is going to be, or at least what he seems to want his film career to be. You know, and so you know he's playing ball. Yeah, and I mean, and I don't, I think it's lame. Yeah. But I also think that, like, he's not really the one that I'm going to be pissed at, like, or really upset at, about, because I, I think that, like, it's the studios and it's it's the people who are actually playing with the billions of dollars that really I, I put more attention on. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know? a, I don't he's know. an actor reading words that other people have written. That's his, that's literally his job. And that's, I think, I, I'm, I, I don't really hold it again. Also being just liking this kind of movies and TV and stuff like that. Like this is one of a million times where I have disagreed with an actor. It's personal politics. Oh, yeah. So yeah. like at this point, I'm yeah. just, I don't, if I, if I just watched things that were made only by people that agreed with me, it, it would, I would be bored out of my mind. There'd be nothing or very little to yeah. watch. Yeah, that is, it's a constant problem, really. And that's honestly, that's not going to change until I think people who aren't 
Well, look, I don't know. I mean, I like I, I get the arguments that we should be sort of removing financial support for, you know, for some some of these kinds of people and whatever. But I don't first of all, I don't really think John Cena rises to that level. Like he's not somebody that I even consider going like, oh, man, that guy, I'm not going to watch his thing because I, I don't want him to get paid. But like it's also I think the answer is more creativity. It's it's not going to be boycotts because it's not really going to do anything. That's just going to be kind of a drop in the bucket and nobody's really going to care. And it doesn't change the fact that the entire studio system and every, you know, everybody in Los Angeles and working in the film industry is not, not, not literally everybody, but the vast majority and a very strong majority and a very powerful majority are people who are like very, very, very hard left. And if you don't agree with that, then you're going to be sort of stuck watching, you know, watching that kind of stuff forever until you get people who aren't that actually creating stuff, making movies that are and shows and everything else that are on par with what those folks are making. So I, I, I just don't see how the answer isn't create more. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the only thing. And also create better, right? Like do, do a better job. Um, I was watching, uh, er, like uh, last week, I was watching the Hollywood Reporter. Um, this is sort of a tradition for me. I always watch pretty much all of the Hollywood Reporter Roundtable series. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but Hollywood Reporter every year around Oscar season brings like their group of top actors and sort of top Oscar contenders in different categories. They do producers roundtable and actors and actresses, uh, directors roundtable. I was watching the, um, the directors roundtable, and forgive me, I don't remember who who said this specifically, but the question was about, um, you know, what are you doing to combat the fact that more people are staying home and not going to the theater and they're not watching, you know, like, what are you going to do if, if people just don't go back to the theater? And I was, I felt like it was really refreshingly good answer to me, which was like, well, we're just going to have to make really good films. Like we're going to have to work on making movies that people will leave their homes to go see. And, and it never came up to be like, you know, Oh, well, we'll just, we'll just try to stop streaming services from sharing our movies or we'll try to like, you know, try to widen the theatrical window or any of those kinds of things. Like they were like, well, we'll just, you know, really, I think the only answer is we got to make better stuff. And I feel that way about a lot of people who complain about, Hollywood and politics it's like it feels like the right answer in almost every case is like just you you're gonna have to go out there and make better stuff and attract more people to your to your stories and um and I mean the tools are available right like the the capital is available and we're already seeing some of that I I don't love we've talked about the um Daily Wire studio stuff I think we've talked about that on, that on the show before I don't I don't love yeah. I don't love it just because I don't love the idea of like making politics the centerpiece of your of your film studio. Although I guess the counter argument is, you know, Disney has already done that, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> so may maybe it's just competing. But um, that said, look, I just think you know we just gotta we just gotta see people making good stuff, and and then you know it'll be fine. But I don't know. Anyway, back to uh, back to Peacemaker. So, uh, I wanted to talk about the music of Peacemaker because, um, you know, James Gunn rather infamous for doing really interesting music choices in pretty much all of his films, and you know, obviously Guardians of the Galaxy music plays such a central role in Peter Quill, and in that, it, like, it, it's really character driven. I would argue that this this show is every bit as like character driven music is is like basically the driving theme of the music on this show like the music for the show is like all this really obscure glam rock and like 80s and i mean to be honest a lot of it's actually been made in the 2000s this is something that i've discovered from really having to shazam a lot of the music on the show a lot of it is actually like a lot more recent but it all sounds like music that was coming out of the 80s right but it's all character driven. And I think in the in the more recent episodes, we got to see like why he's so stuck as a child 
you know? And so all the things that he loved as a, as a little kid are sort of stuck with him at this point. And that's extended to all the music in the show, but I'm, I'm shazamming things on the show. I'm going to, I'm going to read some of the, uh, I'm going to read some of the, um, the choices. So, uh, the, the theme song, the opening theme song is a song called Do You Want to Taste It by a band called Wigwam. <laughs> Do you want it? sounds like a spinal uh, tap. Then, mm-hmm. That's right. That that song has only been shazammed 96,000 times, but that's not by any stretch the most obscure that I've found. Uh, the next one that I shazammed, uh, shazam 35,000 times called Would You Love a Creature by a band called Sister. Then we have uh, Six Feet Under Under by Kissin' Dynamite. Um, Push Push Lady Lightning by Bang Camaro. That's not a real band. It is a real band, apparently. Sinner's Prayer by Sully Erna. I don't know. Um, We got uh, Jawbreaker by The Cruel Intentions. That one has a whopping 16,000 Shazams. Huh. Like 16,000 people total have looked up this song in the history of Shazam. I mean, these are these are deep cuts, like impressively deep cuts. And I I have not looked up, I suppose I could look it up on IMDb. I have not looked up who the music supervisor is, but kudos to whoever that person is cuz these are Really bizarre, really off the wall, incredibly deep cuts. Like, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of this era of music, even. And um, I, I'm, like, at a loss on almost all of these things. And yet, they're all kind of great. Like, they all fit into the scenes really well, and they're ridiculous, and they're comic and over the top, and they're all, like, 80s glam rock I mean, you just you just expect somebody in, you know, spandex and like, uh, you know, just blown out hair, uh, you know, a blonde like wig that's standing up uh, to just jump out of the corner at you. You know, leopard print all over the screen is what this sounds like, essentially. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. Now, I've been enjoying it, though. It's, it's definitely added some uh, uh, another layer of comedy without having to be, I mean, I guess they do kind of joke about it in the ride over, but um, it's just the whole, like yeah. the, in the, in the fifth episode, they're talking about, uh, what is it? Hanoi, uh, um, Hanoi rocks. I mean, what an obscure, obscure band, Finnish rock band formed in 1979. Hanoi rocks. I mean, so it bizarre. is. It works though. It works oh, totally really, works. really well. And I, I actually really enjoyed the, the the way that they introduced the music, where John Cena is just or Peacemaker is just pawing through uh, this uh, the, records. the record collection of this uh, young lady that he has recently become acquainted with, and uh, <laughs> he's just delighted to find albums from Cinderella and like Twisted Sister and stuff like that and she's like oh this was my jam when I was a kid and like puts on a record and also shocking number of record players in this show yeah a lot of record players in this uh, in this universe they're kind of all over the place but anyway I digress but yeah it just the way it was introduced and his his enthusiasm for discovering that someone else liked yeah. the same kind of music. It was just really, really yeah. great. Really well done. Yeah. Uh, so how do you guys feel about this sort of like, we'll call it like the level of wokeness that's in the show, because I feel like there's like an interesting balance to me of, of like it's there, but it's also being made fun of a little bit at the same time. I don't know, Paul. Have you kind of you know what I'm talking about, or am I like off off in the wilderness? Here? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily describe. I wouldn't describe this as woke. I mean, I'm sure somebody would. I, I wouldn't either. But um, but but you can see like I feel like you can see like like glimpses of it, but then it it's like it also gets undercut or made fun of at the same time. Which yeah, I mean, the whole situation is ridiculous. His father is is 
this his he, his alter ego is the literally the white dragon i mean like dudes in a, oh yeah i mean his yeah so his father is i mean honestly his father's a lot of the reason why he's a lunatic but his father is a white supremacist neo nazi supervillain yeah pretty much so i mean, I mean like when that's that, I, I yeah i don't see this as woke really at all um uh uh the and then they kind of undercut a lot of the the making fun of his dad by basically acknowledging there is this deep state um I, I, like <laughs> yeah. it's just it's it's kind of a weird dynamic and i but w- it works because it feels very of the time but it's not it's not like groan inducing if that makes sense yeah there's obviously yeah. a I lot don't of think politics gonna... from today in this but it but it feels like it would for somebody who is not who is disconnected from that and not trying to make a point. It's just, it's just trying to be a workplace comedy. That's all this thing. That's all peacemaker is. It's just, yeah, you know, it's just a workplace comedy and John Cena. Yeah. Is Dwight Schrute. (laughs) Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. No, so actually, I really like describing this as a workplace comedy. I think that's exactly right. I mean, it is essentially the dynamic between these, these like, you know, five people or whatever who actually have to do a job or, you know, do a string of jobs, right, together and not kill each other and not, you know, like actually grow to like each other over time. The the thing I'm thinking of, so there's a scene, and I think it's in the first episode where, he, yeah, it is because he's like escaping from the hospital or whatever. And he stops and he talks to a janitor trying to see if the coast is clear, basically, to see if he can sort of slip out. And the janitor, I got to remember, um, my goodness, it's probably in our, uh, it's not. I'll have to look up who the janitor was because he is a, um, he is a comic actor I've seen in a couple other things. He was in maybe the IT crowd? Could be. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take a look. I don't remember what I saw him in, but I saw him in, a couple other uh, comedy shows. In any case, he's really just kind of a, you know, a, a day player for this, but he stops and talks to this guy. The guy's Indian. And um, he asks, you know, peacemaker asks him like, you know, if the coast is clear and they say, Oh man, you're, uh, you're that peacemaker guy. And he's like, you're the racist super, you know, super villain or whatever. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not racist. Like I'm not. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, I just feel like your body count for, for brown people is a lot worse than it is for white white people. And he's like, well, I can't help, you know, who's doing the crimes where I'm where I'm at. I'm, you know, I'm just whatever. And then he goes, I don't know, man. Like, it just seems like it's really disproportionate. And, and Peacemaker's answer is like, well, fine, fine. I'll just, I'll kill more white people in the future, you know? And it's like that kind of tone for me kind of works because you're doing you are kind of doing comedy around the the kind of the the woke territory you're kind of introducing that that subject matter a little bit but at the same time you're also kind of making fun of it and you're kind of going like well all right well so the answer to this is like okay we'll just kill more of the 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 other race if we're going to be getting into these sorts of i mean of, obviously uh, what else are you going to do you know? stop killing people don't right. be ridiculous yeah, no, of course not. You're going to have to continue doing that. So you couldn't do anything else. So I don't know. I find stuff like that to be pretty interesting. But Paul, I think you've, I think you've nailed it though, because like it really does feel like a workplace comedy, and a lot of the it's not really social commentary, but a lot of the stuff that sort of falls on that line of of sort of you know 2021, 2022 kind of politics or whatever, uh, kind of ends up being um, organic. It's like this is just what people would be talking about today because that's what's going on or whatever. Like they, they, they're just talking about it, you know? So I do kind of appreciate that. It sort of avoids that, that trap a little bit um, for me. And that I'm sure like a lot of people are going to be upset because, you know, what we were talking about with Cena and stuff like that before. But um, yeah, it's, that's not really, you know, I don't really have a problem with it. I don't know. Um, let's talk about this deep state thing for a second though, because that actually is kind of funny. Um uh, Cena's dad, you know, Peacemaker's father, um, a guy named Augie Smith, whose whole deal, uh, you know, apart from being a, a white supremacist, is, you know, he wants to dismantle the deep state. 
And we're supposed to think of that, like, sort of, we're supposed to think of that as, like, this insane supervillain thing. Except for, I, I'm so glad that they, they did actually acknowledge this, because the whole show is about a black ops team that is literally an agent of the deep state. Like, they, there's nothing else to say about it other than the fact that, like, they are the deepest of deep state. They are an off-the-books black ops group that assassinates people on behalf of an agent of the government. Like that's, that's what they do. So to try to pretend that that kind of thing doesn't exist in this universe would be pretty insane. Um, but also it's funny because they also try to rationalize it the entire time, which is, which is great. Yeah. It just, this whole, this kind of happened, this popped up with our Spider-Man stuff too. It's, it's like, they're trying to make fun of Alec, jo Alex Jones, I mean, Alex Jones is an absolute buffoon, but like they try to make fun of him because he's on the TV of his dad when he walks into the house, his, the, this portrayal of it. But then throughout the movie, he's there, these people are being proven correct that there are all these conspiracy theories around every corner and that they're true. And I, I just don't like, yeah. I don't think that's obviously not the intention of the writers. It's, it's just to make a joke that these people are watching crazy things, but then the crazy people are right. Yeah about what is going on i don't know i yeah like in the in this case too like like it's not it's not lizard people but it's like uh bug people right. yeah. i mean might as well it might as well be lizard people yeah. right except for except for instead it's like alien uh uh butterflies as they're called like uh taking up residence in people's brains and and controlling them and body snatchers whatever yeah it's just i it's mean it's weird it's just, it's just this whole, the whole timeline of our world in 2022 is just weird. Yeah. And I think the show pretty well reflects that. It's just absurd. And you can laugh at it or you can go crazy. And here we are laughing at it. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. I Let's, uh, let's wrap up our, our conversation about, um, Peacemaker, I feel like there's, um, I don't know how many episodes there are left, but we're probably about halfway in yeah. uh, at this point. Um, I don't know. We'll probably come back in another episode later and do like a, just a real quick sort of follow up once, once the season ends. But uh, I'll, I'll start by saying like, I, I would honestly, I think I said this to you guys when we, when we first started talking about maybe doing this, if you like this sort of thing, you're really going to love this show is kind of the way that I would put this because it is not a show that's going to be for everybody. But, you know, if you liked like Doom Patrol and I'm a huge fan of Doom Patrol, you're probably going to like this. If you like the Suicide Squad or if you like Slither, if you like some of James Gunn's more like a, not obscure stuff, but like some of his more sort of uh, bloody or gory or like those kinds of things, you're probably going to like this. If you don't like that, um, and you didn't really like the Suicide Squad, then you're probably going to hate this because it is like that amped up 20 times. So, you know, that that's how I'm going to kind of rate that or kind of give, give people sort of my recommendation. I really enjoy it. I've been having a great time watching this show. My mother-in-law came and joined us for the last, the most recent two episodes. She didn't even get like the backstory and she laughed most of the way through and thought it was really funny. So like, we're having a pretty good time. But um, and so I will give it a full star and, and recommend it. But I will also do that with a caveat that, like, if you're not into this, you're really not going to be into this. <laughs> I don't know, Paul. Yeah, I, this is uh, this is uh, it's hilarious. I 100 percent recommend this full full star. Uh, I would even take away the caveats. Um, I, I think it has something for everyone. If uh, if you're of a if, I mean, obviously, this is not for the kids. Uh, this is not this is not for the kids. Definitely not. Yeah, for the wait kids. until they go um, but, to bed, please. But uh, this is just it's it's just funny and it's simple. The plot is simple. Um, there's gratuitous everything, and <laughs> I feel like our content nowadays is just missing a lot of gratuitous gratuitousness, and it's it's kind of refreshing because it always feels like stuff is just I don't know. It just feels so safe. And this is not, this is not we at talk all. About, we've, we, we've talked about that a bunch lately. And we were, I think, I feel like Jen, you and I were probably talking about this last, last week was about like, 
like the kind of weird conformity and safeness of everything that's like kind of neutered content and made it not very not very interesting. And then when you go back and watch stuff from the eighties yeah. or the nineties, you know, you watch you watch like so so later, um actually by the time this episode is out, um uh there will be a new episode of Out of Frame on Demolition Man. Right? And I I love that movie so much. And then I, I watch that movie and I think about like how dramatically different movies are today in terms of the language, in terms of the sort of the situations that they allow characters to be in, in terms of just the overall sort of like anarchic aspect of things. Like anything can happen um, and and like characters can respond to it in in ridiculous or like really aggressive ways or whatever. Then I had a conversation recently about big trouble in little China. And like, I think about that movie, if you've ever seen that movie, it is just an insane thing because somebody's talking about remaking that. Like, I, I forget what, whatever, some studio wants to remake that movie. And um, that would be an insane thing to do because you just, you're not going to get the same level of, of like just bonkersness that that movie actually is. We just don't do that anymore. So I'm kind of digging this show for that reason. I feel like it's kind of going out and doing what a lot of shows just absolutely wouldn't do right now. I don't know. Yeah, I I agree. This show is wild and it is nonstop. And I am actually weirdly loving it. I, I was disappointed when I finished episode five and there wasn't another one to watch after that one and this it sort of surprised me I really didn't think I was gonna like it as much as I do I'm gonna give it the full star and if you would like to watch a a superhero show that is not made by cowards this is the show for you (laughs) Nice. All right. Uh, just to close a loop from earlier, um, Hampton comes in with the uh, with the helpful information. Uh, Rizwan uh, Manji, who is uh, who was the um, the janitor that he comes in, and uh, the show that I was thinking of him from. I'm going to have to look this up. Uh, he's in Atypical, which I like, um, but uh, I'm trying to remember what what show. Hold on a second. Mondays. I think it was in Mondays, which is a, a TV series that I saw. Um, there's a few other things that he was in um, that are sort of a little bit obscure. But uh, he was in The Magicians. And uh, and he's also, even though he may come back later in the series, but he does make it into the opening credit sequence every episode. So... <laughs> So there's that. Um, all right. Let's wrap up our, our discussion of the Peacemaker here. If you are a supporter of the show on Patreon or Subscribestar, stick around, and we are going to do some bonus uh, bonus pot action just right afterwards. Um, if you're not a supporter of the show, well, first of all, thank you for listening anyway. We, we really appreciate that you're here. If you uh, were a fan of what you just heard, please give us a like, uh, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or uh, Spotify, Google Play, like pretty much wherever you're you're listening to the show. Uh, and do consider joining us on Patreon or Subscribestar, either of those, patreon.com slash outoframeshow or subscribestar.com slash outoframeshow. We'll get you access to private channel on Discord, some free swag, um, and the bonus, bonus episodes of the podcast. There's a bunch of cool stuff, a um, little bit more direct access to us if you ever wanted to ask us any questions. But... Um, Either way, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.